The style of the Sikha we're about to learn is much closer to the style of the original Fabrengen, a Fabrengen in Tafshin Mem Aleph on Rosh Hashanah, where the Rebbe speaks about how Rosh Hashanah is the birth of each of us, and therefore it's a time of rededication to Torah, just like a soul has to rededicate itself before it comes into this world. He'll also speak about the Simcha that is felt at this time of the year, a Simcha that already gives an inkling to the experience of Sukkot, which is to come. It's very much tied into the celebration of Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot when the Jewish people returned with Ezra and Nehemia to rebuild the Beis Hamikdash after Golis Bavel. The Pasuk that says that we all stand this day before Hashem. Famously, the Altar teaches us as that this day refers to the day of Rosh Hashanah. And the message is that we stand firm and confident in front of Hashem. In complete Unity, as we'll see, Dosei says, Allah Yidin, meaning every single Jewish person, from the leaders of the tribes, all the way down to the wood choppers and the water carriers, the water drawers, and everything in between, stand together, as Dr. Rebbe explains, that they've come together in a unique kind of unity. Now this impact that we all stand together and with confidence before Rosh Hashanah is actually something that is affected from on high. Because we're in front of the Ebishter, so therefore that causes and influences us to come together in this unique unity. We see this highlighted by Hasidim in the grammatical form of the word Nitzavim. It's in the passive voice. As in Nitzavim, Uvgestalt implying that we are made to stand, we are propped, propped up to be able to stand firmly through Hashem. But it's not good enough for us to rely on the Ebishter lifting us. We have to input as well. And in fact, when we invest our own efforts, not only do we get the result of our own effort, but we almost, so to speak, <coughs> gain the value of Hashem's input as well. We also have the principle that a person prefers something that is theirs over a much greater quantity that belongs to somebody else. So we have to invest something of our own. That when a person invests their smaller portion into a particular investment, endeavor, so they actually get the value of all the greater investment that the other person, the chaver, the so-called peer, has put in. And in our context, the peer that we're speaking of is Hashem. As Rashi interprets the Pasuk, quoted in Masech the Shabbos, Don't abandon your peer, your friend, or your father's friend. Says Rashi, This friend we're talking about is the Ebishta. So by us investing a little bit into making the Nitzavim of Rosh Hashanah, we also get all of the value as if we had created the other 90% that the Ebishta puts in. But us investing our little piece into this endeavor of Rosh Hashanah, we get all of the value of what Ebishter puts in as well. Now, this concept that we've got to put in our own effort is something which starts right at the beginning of Yom Tov, like in every Yom Tov, the first contribution that we make in this regard is the fact that we, as the Jewish nation, sanctify a date so that it should become a Yom Tov because it's all dependent on our deciding the calendar. And that's why the, the Kiddush and the Davening on Rosh Hashanah says that First, Abisha sanctifies the Yidden, and then through us, it becomes a Yom Azikor, and we turn it into Rosh Hashanah. So that's our contribution. We make a contribution. We decide that this is the calendar, and this is when the Yom Tov is going to be. But it's more than that. The fact that Yidden come together, as we typically do on Rosh Hashanah, with a tremendous sense of unity. With a single purpose and a single theme. That takes the already upright, confident stance that we have thanks to the Abish's input and we elevate it even further, we strengthen it either, even further. And that's especially so, the Rebbe says, in the context of a Fabrengen. Especially when we get together in a way that includes physical things that we enjoy. Food that becomes part of our system, part of our bloodstream. Especially when we say which is an indication that the physical 
inanimate object that we're using as food and drink is actually becoming a live object. About that, the Gemara says that the feasting together brings people together in a very unique way. Especially since it's not an ordinary gathering, but this is a fabrengen associated with the yontif, not just any yontif, but specifically Rosh Hashanah. It's about Rosh Hashanah. The pasuk in Nehemiah tells us that the celebrate the, the joy of Hashem is what strengthens us. And there in that same pasuk, <coughs> the Tanakh tells us that this is a time we're supposed to eat delicacies and enjoy uh, sweet wine. Especially it's not an ordinary Rosh Hashanah. It's a Rosh Hashanah that is already a year themed on unity, which is Hakel. The Hakel, even though the practice of Hakel was going to happen in Sukkot, the year of Hakel begins on Rosh Hashanah. How do we know that? Because the Pasuk tells us when is Hakel going to be at the end of seven years. When is the end of seven years? When it's the beginning of the next year. <coughs> so therefore Rosh Hashanah is already the herald of a Shnas Hakel. Something the Rebbe is going to develop as a little bit of a theme in the Sicha, the principle that based on Tilim that says Bakesa, the time when the moon is hidden, i.e. Rosh Hashanah, Le Yom Chagenu, we're already preparing for Sukkot, the day of rejoicing. Chassidus explains as the whatever the themes and messages of Sukkot are, already exist in Rosh Hashanah, but just in a less apparent way. So Hakel is celebrated on Sukkot. But the energy of Hakel is already there on Rosh Hashanah. So the whole theme and message and, and energy of Hakel is already present on Rosh Hashanah, just in a less noticeable way. Therefore, the Rebbe calls to people practically. So you have to say lechaim, you have to say wine. It's Rosh Hashanah. Father Shkir, you've got to say before Shkir because it was uh, uh, going going um, into uh, into Shabbos. So you had to eat before the the Shkir. We say lechaim on a beverage and specifically wine because wine, the pasuk tells us, is something that gladdens the heart of people. Which will then obviously link to a tremendous simcha because the yain is. And also, the simcha should not be superficial, but it should be like the wine that is ingested into our system. The simcha should become part of us. So here you see the Rebbe speaking on Rosh Hashanah about feeling an attitude and, and, and a sentiment of simcha. Especially because this is not just any ordinary get together, but it's a get together of Rosh Hashanah and specifically a Hakel Rosh Hashanah and in a unique place. A great house. What is a great house? A place a place that brings greatness to or increases Torah learning. It's a place where people come to learn on a, red, on a, a, a consistent basis. It's a place where people come on mass in order to daven, and we increase the value of our davening. So all of our efforts should produce the results that they are intended to produce. With that introduction, the Rebbe goes into an analysis of what Rosh Hashanah is about. We know that in our davening, we speak about the fact that today, the day of Rosh Hashanah, is the beginning of Hashem's so-called actions or deeds. On the Chiruk Tzvishon Zeh Mitkoi, one of the big distinctions that Hasidus makes is that Rosh Hashanah is called Zeh, which is a, an, an expression of something which is clear, apparent, and present, versus the creation of the world, which began on Chofei Elul, which is the word Koi, implying something which is not so clear, the type of Nevoas that other Nevi'im have, which is through a Moshul or through a dream. So <coughs> that's something the Rebbe explained in the Maim, Vashot Zechret in Maim, so just between the section we just read and now the Rebbe said a Maimer, that distinction between Ze and Koy is something that the Tzemach Tzedek speaks about extensively. And there are a whole bunch of parenthetical comments on this distinction between Ze and Koy, which appear in Lukutatera and would seem to be from, <coughs> from the Tzemach Tzedek as well. 
What does it all illustrate as an absolute summary? The theme of Rosh Hashanah, this is the day of the beginning of your work. That's firstly something which has a unique connection to the Tzemach Tzedek, and that's why the Rebbe is pointing out that the Tzemach Tzedek speaks about it so extensively. Because the Tzemach Tzedek was born Erev Rosh Hashanah. So that theme of Erev Rosh Hashanah being the birthday of the Tzemach Tzedek, and as we'll see now, Rosh Hashanah being Zayyom Techilas Masecha, something the Rebbe will develop into a theme of the so-called Called rebirth of our neshamas on an annual basis. bris is given in The bris was in the The Rebbe already began this theme in the fabreng and for the tzemach tzedek's birthday. Uh, that what was the maimer the Alter Rebbe said when the Tzemach Tzedek was born was on the theme of <coughs> taking an oath that be, the Gemara tells us that before a person uh, comes into this world they have to take an oath that they will be a Tzedek as we know that the Hayom Yom tells us that this then developed into the beginning of the first three chapters of Tanya. Why did the Alter Rebbe speak about that on this particular occasion? Well, the obvious reason would be because Mashbin Oiso is about the oath that the soul takes before his <laughs> to enter this world. And here is the story of somebody who entered this world. It's Tzedek's birthday. So it makes sense that this is the occasion you speak about Mashbin Tzedek because that is the journey the Neshama goes on before it enters this world. But it's broader than that. It's not only about the Tzemach Tzedek. And his birthday teaches us a great lesson about our experience as a nation with regards to Rosh Hashanah. That theme of birth, birth of a new child, in this case the Tzemach Tzedek, which is obviously specific, and the fact that before a person is born, the soul takes an oath about how they'll behave, is all relevant to Rosh Hashanah. Because Rosh Hashanah is given Briah Sodom Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of the creation of the very first human. So the birth of Adam Arishan, even though he wasn't born in the classical physical sense, but the creation of Adam Arishan is a template for the principle of being born, particularly a Jewish person being born. Why Jewish person specifically? Because the Gemara Yavamas tells us that we as the Jewish nation, we have the collective noun Adam. So when Adam is born, it has a much closer connection to the birth of and annual rebirth of the Jewish people on Rosh Hashanah. And what Mishnah Zokt, as yet a mensch, is an Elam Mole. Mishnah tells us that every single person is a full world. Mishnah in Sanhedrin talking about the value of human life. Just like Adam Arishan was the only human created, unlike the other species that were created in groups, Adam Arishan was created as a single human being so that we could appreciate that every one of us is a full universe. And not only is that a lesson that was relevant at the beginning of creation, but it's a lesson the Gemara says that is relevant to all of us on every single day, is the Fichach Nivra Odom Yechidim. It takes into Yarin Tzurik. Thousands of years ago, they Ebishter created one Adam Horishan so that today each of us would know that we're a complete universe and absolutely valuable. So that makes a much stronger link between the fact that Adam Harishan was created on Rosh Hashanah and the birth of every single person, particularly every single Jewish person, through the course of history which is represented on Rosh Hashanah. Because like any of every other significant Jewish date on the Jewish calendar, when that date recurs, then the energy and the events of that day reappear and they're 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 reenacted so every rosh hashanah is a reenactment of the original rosh hashanah including the fact that that's when Adam Harishan was created. Therefore, we can conclude massive innovative insight that Rosh Hashanah is in a sense the birthday of every one of us. Therefore, if it's the birthday, that's the time to speak about Mashbi Noisa. Especially the fact that the Al Rebbe spoke about the theme of the oath that the Neshama takes before birth on Erev Rosh Hashanah 
Is my name is I that also indicates we bald as by Shana Atzma is the letters from Yadin in the Dugma of Ibriya Sodom Marishan, seeing as Rosh Hashanah is the date of our birth and rebirth on an annual basis, just as it was the date of Adam Marishan's creation. Well, then we have to apply the same principle before the Neshama enters this world and the baby is born. That's when the Neshama takes its dedication of to be a tzaddik. Same thing, Erev Rosh Hashanah, before the rebirth on Rosh Hashanah, we have to make that kind of commitment. Even though the original Rosh Hashanah, when Adam Rishon was created, we know that Adam Rishon was not the first event of the day. There were other things that happened. There were a few hours before Adam Rishon's creation. The Sanhedrin does tell us exactly hour by hour what happened on the sixth day of creation, including how long it was uh, that they should have avoided the Eitz Adas, which is not relevant to our conversation, but he tells us every single thing happened. So, in spite of the fact that there's time before Bria Sada Marishan, where theoretically you could have already spoken about Mashbin Oisai, Erev Rosh Hashanah is certainly a much more clear before, before the birth, before the entrance of the Neshama into this world. Erev Rosh Hashanah represents the commitment that that Neshama should take. The Rebbe is now going to look at the specific calendar layout of that Rosh Hashanah where Rosh Hashanah went into Shabbos, so Thursday, Friday, Shabbos, and, and illustrate how that brings a very, very unique component to the story because other Rosh Hashanah was created on the sixth day of creation. Our calendars never allow Rosh Hashanah to be on the sixth day of creation unless it's second day Rosh Hashanah. So, was created on a Friday. But we have a, a principle in the structure of our calendar that the first day Rosh Hashanah can never be a Sunday, a Wednesday, or a Friday. The Rambam quotes it. Sadiagon even says that it's a Torah requirement. That means our calendar never allows Rosh Hashanah to actually be on the same day of the week as the date which it commemorates. The only way the Einzige Meglechait as he involves us in Rosh Hashanah that you could ever have a Friday Rosh Hashanah is thus give you Rosh Hashanah Zei was we yom based Rosh Hashanah is we yom vav b'shavu. The only way it could ever happen is you've got to have a scenario where second day Rosh Hashanah is on a Friday, which is exactly the the year that the Rebbe is speaking. For how far piyaz us yom based the Rosh Hashanah? Ah, you'll say, but surely the creation of Adam Rishon reflects on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, and here we're saying Friday is the second day of Rosh Hashanah. So I know, but be the take from Rosh Hashanah yom aricho ayin langer tov. We know very well that in, even in halachic terms, Rosh Hashanah is a 48-hour day as opposed to two separate days. So in this scenario, the second day of Rosh Hashanah, which reflects the whole day of Rosh Hashanah, coincides with the correct day of the week when Adam Rishon was born, as it was originally. This particular setup, where we coincide with the Friday, the date of Adam Rishon's birth, is the safe from the Yom Aricha, was the safe Yom Beis Rosh Hashanah. It's not on first day Rosh Hashanah, right? So if we're looking at the two days of Rosh Hashanah as a single day, and now the second day is the one that is a Friday. So that really works well with how Adam Rishon was created, as we've already quoted from Sanhedrin. But Dugma says, "Given by Adam Rishon, as we Adam Rishon is given by Seif Hayyim de Rosh Hashanah." Adam Rishon was created later in the day, towards the end of the day of Rosh Hashanah. And so, if we're looking at the entire Rosh Hashanah period as a forty-eight hour day, and now we're on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, and that's the one that coincides with Friday, it actually works really well with the principle of matching up when Adam Rishon was originally um, originally uh, created. And seeing as we've raised the issue of Rosh Hashanah being two days, let's talk about that for a moment. What's unique about Rosh Hashanah and different to every other Yom Tov is that it's a two-day Yom Tov in Israel too. That emphasizes the theme of the parasha that leads into Rosh Hashanah, which obviously speaks about what Rosh Hashanah is all about. Unity, this is a unique unity. We in Israel are, are observing Yom Tov in the same way. Most Yom Tov, all other Yom Tov, we in Israel do not celebrate equally. We have a second day of Yom Tov, they don't. 
Sai Eretz Yisrael. So what's unique about Rosh Hashanah is that every single Jew on the planet observes it for two days, even in Israel. The land that has this unique oversight from Hashem. On Sai Chutzar, as we do outside of Eretz Yisrael, as well as the diaspora, which is of course where the primary, where the, the majority in population, Jewish population lives, as well as the majority of Jewish infrastructure lives. So people ask the question, where do we find a source in Torah that Rosh Hashanah is supposed to be two days? Some people think there was some kind of an innovation that happened more recently. So the Rebbe is going to bring a Pasuk, Pasuk from, uh, from Nehemia, which we'll see in a second, and, and then link that to the principle of the energy of Rosh Hashanah and the Simcha that is supposed to be apparent at this time of the year. We have a clear passage in Teresh Shachsav, which is in Nechemia, safe in Nechemia. It's really interesting that the, when the Alter Rebbe quotes this passage in Hilchus Rosh Hashanah, he actually quotes it as being from Sefer Ezra, which is based on a Gemara in Sanhedrin that says Nechemia took a little bit too much credit for himself, and so. Uh, he, he, you know, his Sefer gets overrun in a sense by Ezra. Ezra becomes the primary and sometimes we even refer to Sefer Nehemiah, Sefer Ezra, at least as the Alter Rebbe does here. So then, Kapitel Ches, the eighth chapter, talks about the fact here that Jews have come back from, from Babel and now in Eretz Yisrael, it's the beginning of the seventh month, which is obviously Rosh Hashanah, and then told from Rosh Hashanah, as Mihot didn't, so they wanted to know, they had to learn, so they took out a Sefer Torah and they were taught. It's, it's quite similar to Hakel, as we'll see later on, Ezra stands up on a platform and he reads to the Torah from them. So after that, they were told, the Eden were told, as go eat and drink beautiful you know, delicacies. And send um, uh, food parcels to those people who hadn't prepared for Yom Tov. This is a holy day to our God. And don't feel down or depressed because they were they felt that they were ignorant about what Rosh Hashanah was all about. They didn't remember how they were supposed to do things. Because celebrating, being joyous for Hashem or with Hashem, that is what will actually strengthen you. On the Noch, as in the as they get on befoil, then the Torah tells us they did it. They went, they ate, they drank. They sent gifts to each other. They made a tremendous simcha. And then, here comes the part that's relevant to us. How do you know that Rosh Hashanah is a second day? So it says, and on the second day, then they, be, you know, they, they continued the, the process. So the Mephoshim, Rashi, David, etc. They say, the second day over here is not the day after Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, but it means second day of Rosh Hashanah, proof in Tanakh that Rosh Hashanah has two days. And the question is why Taka that year was a shot of two days, and of course it continues to be that way. So the halachic basis for it is because there's always the possibility of a, uh, a Jewish month being a 29 day month or a 30 day month. So there was Ma'aber, which means two days Rosh Chodesh. They, and of course, if you have two days Rosh Chodesh and they are Rosh Chodesh Shisha, you have two days of uh, of Rosh Hashanah. Now, seeing as we've brought this Pasuk, so the Rebbe is going to use this Pasuk to illustrate how Simcha comes into this time of the year, even from Rosh Hashanah. And this Kiril from Nechemia, as we have to Rosh Hashanah, is given by Yechel Kolom Lechel Goyim of Lassi Simcha Gedoyla. So look what happens. There in Sefer Nechemia, it describes that how did they celebrate Rosh Hashanah with tremendous Simcha. So we'll link that to something that the Friedrich Kerber says in a mimer about the reflection of how royalty here on earth reflects how royalty is in heaven. Along the way, the Rebbe is going to take a little bit of a sidebar just to analyze why that should be the case and then come back to the lesson. So here the Pasuk tells us that on Rosh Hashanah they had tremendous simcha, says the Friedrich Rebbe, why is that? Well, look around. When there's a coronation of a king in human society, it's turned into pomp and ceremony and a massive celebration. Likewise, because 
ro- uh, human royalty is similar to divine royalty, the time of coronating Hashem in the heavenly realm, has to be Basimcha Okay, so here's the sidebar. Why is it this way? How can we be so convinced that just because something plays out in the human realm in a particular way, that that is evidence that it's the same way in, in Shamayim? If the roof was mezokt, as we bowed Malchus Adara came Malchus Adirikia, we say it like kind of as an as a fact because the human kingdom is a reflection of the divine kingdom. Is as a vi in Malchus Adara is ashar achtar samelech b'simcha gedola. Therefore, we say with certainty. Look around. Human kings celebrate the coronation. As a zeichem Malchus Adirikia, that the same has to apply when we're coronating Hashem and Rosh Hashanah. It's not Dishail. It's not Dishail. It's a question. There's absolutely no reason to compel, so to speak, Hashem to have to follow a format that is a relevant format here on earth. How can we say with confidence that just because in the heavenly realm the coronation of a king is a tremendous simcha, we know for sure that that's how it is, right? In, in the earthly realm, it's a tremendous simcha. So now we know for sure that that's how it is in heaven. Who says? Maybe that in heaven things operate in a completely different way. And we can extend this question further. What about all the other parables that we use to refer to Hashem? So often we say, we're trying to explain something about Hashem. So we say, you want a marshal to understand how it works. Look at a human king and then extrapolate out to Hashem. How can we decide that a particular thing operates in a particular way on high by the Mabishtan in Hashem's realm because that's how it is done here on earth. What a chutzpah, you know, who gives us the right to say that? And that same question applies to the Moshal, the Magid says, just like the, the vision, the image of a person's child is etched into their mind, that's the human experience, so we as the Jewish people were etched into the Ebishter's so-called uh, vision, so-called thought. The difference being that when you're dealing with a human king, uh, or a human father, I should say, a person has never had a child, he can't have a, an image in his mind of what his child will look like. The Magdalene explains what's different about us is even before we were made, our image was already etched into the Ebishter's so-called thoughts. Because by the Ebishter, time is not an issue, past and present is not an issue. So the big question is, how could we say with absolute confidence that because we observe certain things in the human realm, that's how they are in the spiritual realm and particularly in the divine realm. Who says? The Rebbe gives a very simple explanation. It's not causal. It's not because things are in our world, that's why they are in the higher world. Fakert. It's the exact opposite. To be ridiculous to suggest that because things operate in a particular way in our realm, therefore that influences how they are in the higher realm. Because of what we're observing happening in our world, that is evidence for us that this is how it is in the higher realm. Again, it's not because things operate this world this way in our world, therefore we imagine the same by the Abisha. It's because this is how the Abisha has designed our world, we recognize that that's how it is on high. Why? Nochmeh. Because the way things operate is because something is a particular way on high is that evolves into how they are here. So if we want to understand and have insight into how things operate in the higher realms we have to look at how things operate here. And from that, we can have insight and understanding of how things are on high. And the same thing applies to all of the parables that we've referred to. Like the Pasuk says, from my flesh I can see godliness. 
Weil man will, als sein in Jolim soll und sein nicht nur in einem Ephem von Emunah. The objective of Judaism is not that we should just believe the things of Judaism. We should see it, should be real, it should be something we know. We don't believe if it's day or night outside. We know if it's day or night outside. We shouldn't just believe in the Ebeshter, we should know the Ebeshter. The Dirk Halashim from the Rambam is later nit lahamin ki medube kame peomim. As the Rebbe has many times pointed out, in the beginning, the Rambam tells us, the beginning of Hilchus Yisoyed Torah, that there's no mitzvah to believe in Hashem, the mitzvah is to know Hashem. And we'll talk about that briefly for a moment. So this is now a, par a parenthesis within a parenthesis. That's what the Tzemach Tzedek brings in Derech Mitzvah Sechon Mitzvah Samon HaSelikus. V'yashayich zogin atzivah feimunah b'Hashem. How could there be an instruction to believe in the Ebishter? Pshas Emunah is the Yisoyed on the Akdama from Alam Mitzvah Svetzivuim. If there's no belief, then there's no reason to follow any instruction. Because whose instruction are you listening to? You don't believe. It's a Dottom Evoy. So therefore, the Tzemach Tzedek explains at length. As nice, if I've demas the Tzivuim safety, prote ho Emunah. First of all, Emunah has many, many facets to it. So you could have a very broad, superficial kind of Emunah. And the Mitzvah is to develop a more mature, detailed Emunah. Primarily the message is that the instruction is it's not sufficient to just believe. We actually have to know. So me besori echseloka. Therefore, the Eibushter has constructed possibilities of how we get to know the Eibushter. Look at ourselves. Look at our reality. See how it operates, and appreciate that that is the evolutionary outcome of how the Eibushter made the world. Was der Fall? Davon haben wir schon im von der Mathe in eurem Hase bechtet zu verstehen, wie die wie die Normen sind. Man muss sich selbst erklären. That's why we need these Mishalim. That's why we need these tangible expre expressions to explain to us how things work in the Eibush Israel. Was der Zeit Adam und Mathe? In fact, one of those parables is us ourselves. Is it Dama the Elin? Why we called Adam? Because we are we emulate the Eibush. So if we're designed to be, to emulate and to be in the model of the Ebishter, so we could look at what's going on in our world and that will help us understand things about the Ebishter. So a king helps us understand the royalty of the Ebishter and a father helps us understand the parenthood of the Ebishter. We'll bring it back to what the, what the Friedrich Rebbe says in his Maimer. When we see that human coronations are accompanied by tremendous joy, we know that the same applies on high. That was a sidebar about understanding how you can rely on a human parable to understand a divine concept. Let's get back to the concept, the Simcha. The Simcha that is associated with the coronation of a king with Rosh Hashanah. So we already touched on the fact that in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, when the Yidin went on Rosh Hashanah to celebrate and to share with each other, then the Pasuk tells us, and there was a second day of Rosh Hashanah. That sold the pasuk was a demut biyam hashen de Rosh Hashanah given, and the Torah tells us what happened on that second day of Rosh Hashanah. Biyam hashen in Esv Rosh Hashanah v'chol ha'om v'akoyanim v'alavim. Now, as when everybody comes together, there's a sefer. They come to Ezra la Haskel the Divrei Torah to understand what Torah is all about. Vayim to kosev at Torah. They discovered in the sefer Torah that he took Rosh Hashiv Hashem biad Moshe that the Ebrusha had commanded Moshe Hashem Yeshvu b'nei Yisrael b'Sukkos b'Chag b'Chodesh Hashvi that they had to have another holiday coming up called Sukkos where you sit in a Sukkah. So we're going to see now a link between Rosh Hashanah, generally, second day Rosh Hashanah, specifically, and Sukkot. So then Ezra tells them, that they had to advertise everywhere. Everybody's got to go out to the mountains. Go get all the materials that you need in order to make a sukkah and in order to make a little of an esrik. Again, parenthetically, why does he say go out? So this expression, go out of the city to get these things, is a similar expression to what he said in Sefer Chagai. Debishter said, almost in surprise, The time has not yet come to build Hashem's house. 
In other words, implying they have to build a base amigdash. On the Hemshech Hosea, Hateon Gesagt, Alu Hohor, Vavesim Eitz, Bona Habais Gemer. There the Ebesha says, go up the mountain to bring the materials in order to build the base amigdash. So how come there it's go up the mountain and here it's go out to the mountain? The Rebbe already touched on this in a Fabrengen earlier uh, on Rosh Chedesh Elul. So the Chilik Benayim Dosh State Tzi'u Hohor, and Dosh State Alu Hohor. How come here in Nechemia it says go out to the mountain, and there in Chagai it says go up the mountain? What's the previous Papash is actually a really simple reason for this. In Chagai, Retzich, Vegin de Matzav, Kedem, Shedivn, Habayis. Chagai is describing before the construction of the Beis Amikdash. And when you've gained point in the Beis Amikdash, you've got to go out and you've got to build the Beis Amikdash. So there's no Beis Amikdash, and now you're going to produce one. And that's a, is that an aliyah from a Matzav, the Kedem, Shedivn, Habayis, a Matzav, from being in Habayis. That's an aliyah. Go up the mountain because you're about to have an aliyah. You're about to upgrade from having no base amigdash to having a base amigdash. But so zoktin de blashen alu hahor gamer. Mashenkin and Nechemia, Retzach Vegna Matsavos, see Shing Dod, the base amigdash, but Nechemia, the base amigdash, has already been constructed. Where zoktin divided to get pesukim, as the Torah there describes. On the forest, see oh hahor gamer, then you're going out of a holy place to the mountain to get the materials that you need for sukkahs. Isn't this interesting? It's the second day of Rosh Hashanah. They're being told about what they have to do for Sukkot. They obviously haven't yet started to celebrate Sukkot. The fact that they made a commitment at that point. That they'll do what Ezra told them. To go put together all the materials, find the materials, put together the materials and celebrate Sukkot. Is Machshov or Teva Kodesh Baruch Hu Mitzvah for the says we know when a person has a positive thought that they commit to, they Bishu will create the opportunity to link it to action. But maybe as Member Shas the Machshov or Teva Shem Fazichit as Dos Vet Arab Kumin and Amaisa Befoil, they at that point are already guaranteed that the commitment will bear fruit and they will actually celebrate a proper Sukkot. Nachmer, it's beyond that. The Pasuk then tells us that they went and they did exactly as Abish had instructed through Moshe and Aaron. Sorry, not in that context with regards to Korban Pesach. So we're talking of here in the, in the desert, right? When they were told about the mitzvah of Korban Pesach. So the Pasuk says, Asks Rashi, what do you mean by Yelcha Vayasu? It's two weeks before Pesach. This instruction happens on Rosh Chedesh. And what do you mean they went and they did it? On a fan fit. And the Mekavin Shakibul Alem, he answers, because they committed themselves to keep Pesach, to bring the current Pesach, my Lelem Akoskil also, they should consider it as if they did it already. Bezas in Posak Shtet Vayasu, Ona Chofadimian, to the extent that the Posak says they did it. It doesn't say, and it was like they did it. It says, Vayasu, they did it. Let's reflect that to the Jews on second day Rosh Hashanah in the time of Nehemiah. But again, it's a sukkah when they're now committing to the sukkah. It's not even sukkahs. It's two weeks, just like in the story of Pesach. It's two weeks before sukkahs. And it's already considered as if they had done it because Machshav HaToven, you make that clear, um, absolute commitment. They should consider it as if it's happening. Then the Pasuk then the Pasuk continues and tells us what actually happened in terms of the Jews fulfilling the mitzvah of Sukkah there and then. They brought the materials, they built sukkahs in their own homes, they built sukkahs on their roofs, in their courtyards. They came in the base Amigdosh, and in the big open uh, roadways in front of the main gates. How great was the rejoicing on that Sukkot? Something they had never seen since the time of Yoshua ben Nun, hundreds of years earlier. By the way, again parenthetical, So now this Pasuk tells us that not only did they make private Sukkot, but they made a Sukkot in the Beis HaMikdash as well. State in Tshuvah Sagoinim, that brings up an issue that the Tshuvah Sagoinim quotes as Mehot Ba'zei Gefrech, Simit Af Machan HaSukkah Eichen HaBeis HaKnesses. Tshuvah Sagoinim says that people asked, are you required to make a Sukkah in a Shul? The argument not to is because Sukkah is supposed to be a place where you live. Who lives in a Shul? 
So Khathila Dav I mean uh Azam Dafnit. So the first thought is you don't need a sukkah in a shul. But I'm a sukkah to have sign tape shake to duru because the whole purpose of sukkah the Torah tells us Basukah is Teshva, you have to dwell in a sukkah, which the Gemara tells us is gain the duru. It has to reflect how you dwell the rest of the year, in other words in your home. Dafamachin that would imply that at home, that's where you live, that's where you need a sukkah. Sure, where you don't live, you don't need a sukkah. That was the first thought. He continues. He has to have a sukkah. Why not? For guests. He actually makes a reference to what was going on at that time where many great scholars lived in Baghdad. And they had sukkahs in the shuls. What's relevant to us is his source. And I bring to us as a Zay is given in Mikdash from the Posuk. He says, because look, the base of Mikdash had a sukkah. So surely a shul does. And he quotes our Posuk. From the Posuk in Nechemi, where state, as we ask them, sukkahs, but Chatz is based on Kim. Where did they make a sukkah? Amongst other places in the base of Mikdash. And then he also concludes by saying, then he also concludes by saying, then he also concludes by saying, so that's what we do practically. Coming back, what's relevant to us, there's this link between Suk- uh, Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot. There's a Simcha already, and it's considered as if they had already fulfilled the mitzvah of Sukkot, even though they had just made the commitment to it. From Kol Hanal, from all of that, from Dem, Vosvet, Tzot, Nechemia, from the Tshuvah Sagerim, Eti Pratim, Shabazeh, both from the Pasuk and from the Tshuvah Sagerim, Kemenoi, Arisnem, Kamer, Mozim, Vechulei. There are certain insights that these allude to. The Rebbe uh, commonly would say that something is open for further analysis if there's no source that the Rebbe could point to and say it's in these books. So what can we learn? The big innovation the Rebbe is going to introduce here is the link between Second Day Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot and that has a practical impact on our preparations and our influence on others. Eina Funze. One of the lessons of here is that second day Rosh Hashanah is a day to start preparing for Sukkos. Uh, second day of Sukkos is a time for us to commit ourselves to be absolutely on board with all of the things that we need to do for Sukkos with the greatest of Simcha. Going back to what we quoted in Chesidus, as Beresh Hashanah Zanin Dodin Yolim from Chagenu Chag Asukas and Anufim from Akesel Canal Sif Base, that all of the things, the elements, the themes, the the energies of Sukkos are compacted inside Rosh Hashanah, just in an, in a way that's not noticeable, and therefore when a gal of foil that has practical implication. As every yard gets into free to get his values of Shalom Shlifneze, discussed in previous Fabrengans and in previous years, wegen dem Inim from the Shalchem Monis Le Nochen Le. That we have a responsibility to help out those people who are not ready for Rosh Hashanah either because they haven't prepared or because they don't have the means. We have to have the same kind of project for Sukkot. We have to make sure that you didn't have all of the supplies and resources that they require in order to celebrate Sukkot, not only with Simcha, but with a tremendous Simcha. And then we also have to ensure that the days between Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot, not only should they be days of practically preparing for Sukkot, but here's the big chap, as a Zol and Zayn, Teg ongefilled to mit Simcha. These should be days filled with tremendous joy on Simcha Gedol Moed, not just ordinary joy, but an extreme joy. Part of the way that we achieve this is by providing for other people everything that they need in order for them to be able to celebrate. And by doing this, we come to the ultimate Simcha. The Simcha that is associated with Mashiach and the absolute Geula. And then the Rambam tells us, Mashiach will build the base Amigdash, like Ezra and Nehemiah did, bring all the Eden back together, Territ Yisrael, as Ezra and Nehemiah did in small measure. This ingathering should be like Hakka, where it's men and women and children and the Gerim. It's the in dem yard should happen in this year. In this year, which the Rebbe identified as a Shnas Hakel, that should be a year that brings in great Brocha. And even before Mashiach comes, we should all be written and sealed immediately for life. 
Vasameh Kulam Tzadikim, we should all be entered into the book that is reserved for Tzadikim, which is in fact the entire Jewish people. Should be a ksiva vechasim atoiva in revealed material and spiritual brochas uh, in a tangible and accessible way immediately.